yeah, frame rater. As a classic Atari fan, I stumbled across this Atari flashback in a local store for cheap. I decided, hey, why not? I've heard good things about the flashbacks. Turns out I brought home the original Atari flashback from 2004, which is sometimes called the Mini 7800. I guess the resemblance is used to imply it's backwards compatible, as the 7800 was for 2600 games. There are both types here, but it's largely in favor of the 2600 with 15 games. The 7800 only has 5 games on this collection. I'm good with the design. The 2600 had controller ports on the back. I'll take the 7800's front ports any day. Oh, this looks cheap. NES on a chip, cheap. This is the only flashback console to use this hardware. Future revisions used a more fitting 2600 on a chip hardware. Basically what this means is that the games present are remakes. A lot of the time these aren't given the most attention to detail, so you'll notice differences between them and the original games. There's only the white audio cord, which means no stereo sound, however the 2600 and 7800 were both mono anyways, so no big deal I guess. Ironically, some of these games have already been ported to NES on a chip hardware before. Atari had their own plug and play from two years earlier with games like Adventure, Breakout, Gravatar, and Yars Revenge in common. The flashback sold for $45 retail when it was released, while most plug and plays sold for $20. I could get the Activision plug and play instead for $25 less, which is exactly what I did back then and I loved that thing. With all this in mind, it's important to consider a big advantage the flashback has over those, which is multiplayer and an AC adapter, cause screw using AA batteries. For multiplayer, you have air-sea battle, asteroids, canyon bomber, centipede, skydiver, sprint master, and warlords. A few others can be played in take turns style, but does anyone still do that for these old games? If you're just starting out, working at your first job with only a TV and Atari flashback to come home to, then multiplayer could be fun with a partner. Though realistically, I don't see this sticking around in your living room for long. Unfortunately, the flashback's ports were rushed, with the product being given just 10 weeks for production before hitting the shelves. It came out in November, so this probably had something to do with Christmas. The games are presented with control flaws, occasional flickering graphics, and some of these are hugely inaccurate to their originals. Before we check out the games, how about that controller? As you can tell, it's made to resemble the 7800s, but is much smaller. It's an odd design with a joystick that only moves nudges in its 8 available directions. The buttons are okay, though to me it resembles something you'd find in a kid's meal toy. It's effective, but cheap. There's a select and pause button, which is cool to have right on the controller instead of the 7800 console interface. Power and reset are still over there. The select button is used to change between single and multiplayer modes, also game types. Sadly you can't change this mid-game, so then your only choice is to hit the reset button, which is also how you'll leave to choose another game. You see the 9 pinout? Don't let this misguide you, these are not programmed to work with your 2600, and vice versa. Alright, as promised, let's take a closer look at those games. I love Adventure, and this is a pretty lackluster version of it. The level design and look is preserved, but there are certain issues such as your player speed being dramatically slower. Also, dragons don't follow you between screens. That detail enhanced the adrenaline factor in what was otherwise a pretty tame experience. Without that, you're wandering around these mazes without much of a worry and that makes it much less enjoyable. The game's sound effects are noticeably different, but I can't blame them for that since they're not using the same TIA chip that the 2600 used. One constant annoyance for me was the joystick, which occasionally reads the wrong directions. There might not be much breathing room down there, causing incorrect presses to occur on the joystick, but that's just my speculation. Air-Sea Battle isn't the most fun Atari 2600 game, but if you're a fan of it, then you'd probably find some enjoyment out of it here. It's a pretty easy game to replicate. Asteroids doesn't have the anti-gravity mechanic, and for this, the port misses out on a huge part of what made it fun. You do get momentum for moving forward, but only in tiny bursts of speed. Even with the multiplayer modes, this is a bad port of 7800's Asteroids. I'm convinced Battle Zone is impossible to play. Enemies will spawn right in front of your face and kill you instantly. Even when I tried to play this legit, your only choice is to back far, far away, and only then can you land a successful shot. By this point, something else has probably already killed you. I grew up with the 2600 port of this game. I assure you, it was never like this. Breakout's a game that begs to be played with paddle controllers. 
I do appreciate that they've made the effort to preserve these games for the time, but a joystick just doesn't cut it. Would have been better to have a different game here altogether. Canyon Bomber was replicated well, although the playfield is a bit smaller. Centipede, based on the 7800 version, is negotiably the best game on the thing. It plays, sounds, and looks great! Cooperative makes for some short-lived excitement. Oh my god, what happened over there? Crystal Castles is exceptionally difficult to play. The original was hard enough. Now play while getting stuck on everything as you run about. Not a good time. 7800's Desert Falcon has flickering graphics a lot of the time. It's not unplayable, but I can't say it's enjoyable. The frame rate drops frequently enough for this to affect the experience as well. Best to play this one elsewhere. Food Fight is a fun 7800 game that doesn't get re-released often, so it's nice to see here. Strangely, the game is much slower and thus a lot easier. I found myself getting very far into the game without much of a challenge, even on the hardest of difficulties. Gravatar is a game that relies on learning its difficult physics to play. Translating that into a completely different system will require a keen attention to detail. You know where I'm going with this? It's rough. Haunted House. It played fine, but the difference in sound changes the atmosphere of the game. I imagine there was a level of intention to make the original game sound creepy? But here, that familiar eerie feeling just isn't there. Millipede was pretty good, with all those crazy enemies from the original present. None of these games are going to feel identical to their counterpart, there are always at least subtle differences. And with that in mind, I feel this is a very respectable version of 2600's Millipede. Planet Smasher is the 7800 game. Plays a bit slower here, but from what I can make out, the gameplay is intact. You might want to put this one on mute, I imagine this annoyed many parents. Saboteur is an unreleased Atari prototype where you save the Gorfons from the evil robots by shooting everything you see on screen. Then use your attacks to take down a boss moments after. It actually plays quite well here, which makes me wonder why Food Fight couldn't have run like this. Skydiver. Line up your target and parachute down. Much like Air Sea Battle, there isn't much to it, so its recreation here doesn't feel as messy as some of the others. Solaris. It's an advanced game for the 2600, so I was surprised to see it on here. But there's no surprise in finding out that it was butchered. The movement was much smoother in the original, whereas here your ship instantly jerks around as if this were Galaga. There are countless animations missing. It's got the right idea, just not the right gameplay. Sprint Master might be enjoyable with certain controller setups, but I can't recommend it here as the joystick is a bit unreliable with its movements, as explained earlier. Warlords was fine. It's a serviceable attempt at bringing another paddle game to the joystick. This works way better than Breakout. I had some fun with it in multiplayer. Yar's Revenge looks the part, but you can't move in eight directions like the original. Being locked to four makes the gameplay more frustrating to deal with than I feel it's worth. Many of the Flashbacks games use the eight directions, so what happened with Yar's Revenge? Ultimately, the first Atari flashback was shoddily thrown together to meet sales targets, and the devs were probably well aware of that. Compared to a generic plug-and-play, the original flashback has slightly more games and a few extra features. It's basically a deluxe version of an early 2000s plug-and-play, but as far as these things go, even that isn't saying too much. Most other methods of playing Atari today dominate the original flashback, especially those with HDMI out. This was fun to look back on in a historical sense, but there's hardly a reason to seek out this flashback anymore. The following year, the same team who worked on this original returned with Atari's respected Flashback 2 system that uses 2600 on a chip hardware. It included 40 games, better controllers, and the ability to swap out with other 2600 compatible controllers. Funny how these improvements somehow knocked $15 off the original's price tag. Something pretty neat that came as a result of this flashback are the NES ROMs that have been dumped online. This can be useful in emulation for a system that might not have a 2600 emulator. I figured I'd give these games a shot in an actual NES using an EverDrive, and here's how that looked. They all ran just fine. The Intellivision plug-and-plays were also dumped at some point. 
What you're seeing here is unfortunately emulator footage, as for whatever reason, this one shows a black screen when I load it in my EverDrive. Well, that's about all there is to say, so thanks everyone for watching, and I hope to catch you frame raiders in the next video.